Hello and welcome to The Broken Sword. Today we have a somewhat longer, somewhat more ambitious video for you all. How Sauron Makes War. As you might be able to guess by the video's length, this has been a long yet enjoyable dive into exploring the Dark Lord's methods of warfare in some greater detail, and by way of comparison we will look at how Sauron's strategy and tactics track with real world wartime philosophers and theorists, such as the famous Sun Tzu, the ancient Chinese philosopher, and Baron van Clausewitz, a prominent Prussian strategist who observed Napoleon's greatest victories and defeats and summed up the lessons of the age in his book On War, one which we will come back to in the video. How Sauron uses men and material tracks closely with their ideas, and his use of terrorism as a strategy of warfare predates the rise of global terrorism in the 21st century. So let's have a look at how this comes together. For Clausewitz, war was politics by other means, connecting warfare explicitly to political gain in a way it had not been before. This is obviously true of Sauron's actions, as the wars waged by the Dark Lord against the free peoples of Middle-earth have a political purpose, and violence as a means in itself has a tactical purpose. Sauron's use of outright terrorism of which we have numerous examples such as the constant raids on Gondor and Rohan, which keep the population in a state of constant fear and saps the morale of the population, which brings us to the use of spies and the idea known in wartime strategy as fish in water. This is the ability of enemy combatants to hide within civilian populations, of which we have one more obvious example of a fish in water within The Lord of the Rings. Being a native of Rohan, we have Grima Wormtongue, who acted as a spy for Saruman and gradually poisoned King Theoden, keeping him from acting against the rise and betrayal of Isengard. Sauron's nature is that of a deceiver and it is true to say his words are more deadly by far than his martial prowess. As Saruman's words are described as having a dangerous ability to persuade, Sauron is on another level entirely. He is of an order higher than mere mortals, and his use of force, that of dark magic, is the most prominent example of Sauron's unending campaign of terrorism. The most dangerous aspect of Sauron's thinking is his inhuman patience and planning which separates him in purpose and practice from Morgoth, whose wars were driven purely by his desire to destroy and mar all of creation, evil for its own sake. Sauron is more complex in his thinking, as he learned from history to avoid repeating it. Presently we will look at his first encounter with Numenor and a battlefield loss, and how he turned that into a long-term plan that wiped out Numenor's entire civilization from the map. It begins with the forging of the rings, and the battles which would follow. But quickly before I get onto that, would you actually like to see a video comparing the likes of Sauron and Morgoth, the big two baddies from Tolkien's Legendarium? A video going over the main key differences between these two would make a very interesting video, so if you would like to see that, please leave me a comment of Sauron and Morgoth, and we will get working on that for you. In the year 1200 of the Second Age, Sauron approached the elven realms in the guise of Anatar, the Lord of Gifts, an emissary from the Valar, and unable to deceive the likes of Alwand and Gilgalad, he was nevertheless able to trick the great smith Celebrimbor into forging the Rings of Power. This is the background, all the way into the Second Age, of what would lead to a number of terrible and costly conflicts. You have the War of the Elves and Sauron, the War of the Last Alliance, and then later of course, the War of the Ring as well. In total there were 20 rings, infused with magic and subtle craftsmanship. We have done a video on Sauron's intent for the rings previously, but we can shortly recap his intent here. He intended to get these rings forged, to gift them to powerful peoples of Middle-earth so that when he put on the Master Ring, it would act as a conduit of control, allowing him to intermingle his thoughts and his will with those who would wear them. 
In the end, his plan went a bit awry, and only the nine mortal men would truly be subdued and brought under his power, but it gives insight into his way of making war, that is, a matter of control. A matter of power for Sauron. Power for its own sake. He is a foul spirit driven utterly by designs of making order, his brand of order for Middle Earth. The Dark Lord's investment in the forging of the Rings of Power would prove not to be entirely in vain, as the nine mortal men would prove useful allies in the end, becoming the Nazgul, ring wraiths whose lord, the Witch King of Angmar, would prove a deadly and capable lieutenant of the Dark Lord in later years. In 1693 of the Second Age, the War of the Elves and Sauron would begin, though Sauron's might would prove to be so devastating that many of the realms remaining to the Elves in Middle-earth would be destroyed in this conflict. Gil-galad was pushed all the way back, and Numenor would come to his aid in this conflict by raising the largest army ever fielded in Middle-earth. Their combined forces culminated in the Battle of the Gwathlo in the year 1701 of the Second Age. Sauron's army was driven from the field and the Dark Lord barely escaped with his life, returning to Mordor with his determination for revenge on the elves and men solidified. Their victory was absolute. In the aftermath of the Battle of the Gwathlo, where Sauron's forces were routed, Numenor would establish colonies in Middle-earth and oppress their fellows. As are all societies of oppression, it would soon be divided. On one side of the split fell the faithful, those who remained loyal to the elves and the old ways. Then opposing them were the king's men, those who did not, those who rejected the idea that mortality was a gift. Sauron was not worried by these mortals as they fought between themselves, and he became ever more arrogant. So despite the Numenorians establishing colonies on the coasts of Middle-earth from 1800 onwards, he cared little. His shadow was able to reach many of those who went this way, as well as also spreading the opposite way, eastwards as well in secret. He would take many self-proclaimed titles, like the King of Men or Lord of the Earth as examples. However, as the years passed, Numenor had many kings and queens, but it came a time when he dealt a great blow to the ego of the reigning king of Numenor who usurped the throne in 3255 and had named himself Arpharazon the Golden. And here, Sauron drew the ire of the most prideful king to ever sit on the throne, to ever hold the scepter. Arpharazon would prepare an almighty force and sail and march straight to Mordor itself. In this battle, Sauron would not fight as he would earlier at Gwathlo. Instead, his forces fled the field at the sight of this Numenorean host and they marched to the Black Gate unopposed. There, Sauron emerged in his fair form from Barad-dûr and he knelt, humbling himself before the Golden King swelling his ego to states previously unfathomed. What is most important for our purpose is how the armies of Numenor were able to rout the forces of Mordor on the field of battle, yet how little this will mean for the long term. Sun Tzu wrote, It is not the height of skill to win 100 battles. It is the height of skill to win without fighting. And what we see next is exactly that. And Sauron came, is the calling of Numenor's doom. He was taken from his fortress, from safety and the symbols of his might, and imprisoned on Numenor. But it was not long before the magic of this foul spirit would begin working all around him. It seems that humbling himself before the king had done much to soften the king's heart to Sauron, to disarm him, and soon he would be the king's counsellor, offering him advice deemed fair and wise. The irony is really well done here, as Arpharazon is marked as a character by his fear of death, and death in the Tolkien legendarium is known as the Gift of Men. So, when Anatar appeared in the guise of the Lord of Gifts, it may have been his most honest form, for the gifts he brought were intended for every man, woman, and child on the island. This is total warfare and ends with mass civilian casualties and the sinking of Numenor. It comes only of his humiliation on the field and want for revenge. 
and out of it the world was made. For darkness alone is worshipful, and the Lord thereof may yet make other worlds to be gifts to those that serve him, so that the increase of their power shall find no end. And Arpharazon said, Who is the Lord of the darkness? Then behind locked doors Sauron spoke to the king, and he lied, saying, It is he whose name is not now spoken, for the Valar have deceived you concerning him, putting forward the name of Eru, a phantom devised in the folly of their hearts, seeking to enchain men in servitude to themselves. For they are the oracle of this Eru, which speaks only what they will. But he that is their master shall yet prevail, and he will deliver you from this phantom, and his name is Malkor, Lord of all, giver of freedom, and he shall make you stronger than they. His agitation of the king proved successful, and his urging to make war upon the undying lands and to defy the ban of the Valar. Sauron is to play on the king's ego and fear and manipulates him into waging war on Valinor, landing on the shores of a man before being buried by a massive landslide of giant stones, where Arpharazon would remain. Meaning, actually, in the end, he would have his wish. There in the Cave of the Forgotten he is to remain, trapped forever, but immortal, until the end of all things and Dagor Dagorath. Battle of all battles. So as it is said, it is not the height of skill to win 100 wars. It is the height of skill to win a single war without fighting. When the waves rolled over the once grand civilization of Numenor, pulling the island beneath the waves, Sauron laughed, yet he was destroyed, at least in a way. His physical body sundered violently from his spirit, yet his spirit did still remain, fleeing back to the safe confines of the Black Tower. Sauron defeated Numenor not from the field, but from the inside. Sauron would poison the mind of Arpharazon and lead to the utter collapse and destruction of Numenor. All warfare is deception, wrote Sun Tzu, and in this, Sauron is unequalled in all the ages of Middle-earth. Sauron is as dangerous an advisor as he is an opponent in the field. Taking Sauron back to Numenor as a prisoner was a prelude to the end, a Calabeth, the downfall of the greatest nation of men to ever exist in Arda. Sauron was, as mentioned, destroyed in the end, and yet he laughed. He is willing to die to spite his enemies, which proves that he is as dangerous a foe to ever exist in fantasy. Only nine ships would survive the wrath of the Valar, led by Elendil and his sons Isildur and Anarion, which led to the creation of the southern kingdom of Gondor and the northern kingdom of Arnor in Middle-earth. The king of Arnor held the title High King and had its capital as Anuminas, whereas Gondor's initial capital was Oskilia, but also homed the cities of Minas Anor, later known as Minas Tirith, and Minas Ethil, which during the War of the Ring was known as Minas Morgul. The Second Age was not over though, and in 3429 Sauron's army attacked Gondor and besieged Oskilia, taking the fortress of Minas Ethel II. Here, the last alliance of elves and men would be formed over the course of two years to oppose Sauron, where their forces came together at Amon Sul, later known as Weathertop, and from there they would cross the Misty Mountains to be joined by the elves of Mirkwood and Lothlorien II, as well as the dwarves from khazad Again, Sauron's deception is on display, as the grievances suffered by the Elves of Mirkwood in ages past would cause a rift in the Alliance. They refused the command of the High King of the Noldor, Gilgalad, and this would lead, during battle, for them to ignore orders and attack early, leading to the death of King Orifer, the father of Thranduil of Mirkwood. But at the same time, it is worth mentioning, Alrond would take up the last Noldor stronghold remaining in Middle-earth, that of Imladris, Rivendell, a place of law and scholarship, one untouched by Sauron's foul spirit and free from its corrupting powers. But among those opposing them were those that had once wielded the Nine Rings which would turn the Nine Men into wraiths, thralls unto Sauron and his to command. 
Throughout the early Third Age, the Witch King of Angmar would be a lucrative investment for the Dark Lord, as he would do great harm to the remainder of the Numenorean settlements in the northern part of Middle-earth, breaking the realm of Arnor and slowly taking it apart. First Rudawa, then Cardalan, and finally Arthodyne. Of the many advantages, Sauron and the combined host of the Dunlendings, Easterlings and Corsairs of Umbar give us a picture of what happens in an army so constituted. An army pressed into service with the individuals who comprise the company, unenthusiastic or loathing to give their all for victory. We discover by way of this observation a fundamental flaw in Sauron's way of war. His allies are distrustful of one another, and his most prominent vassal, Saruman, acts of his own volition and his own reasons. The White Wizard is less a thrall of Sauron than a would-be competitor for his position in the books. While his loyalty to Sauron in the films gives the Fellowship a secondary antagonist needed for that media. Although there are some that may even argue, Boromir is somewhat of an antagonist as well in that first chapter. After Boromir tried to take the ring, Frodo slipped it on his finger and disappeared, leaving the once proud captain of Gondor to face his failure and moment of weakness at the same time when he is surrounded by the enemy and feathered by arrows until he could fight no more, though Frodo was able to escape. Then when Aragorn arrives, Boromir is dying and though he doubts Boromir's accounts of the events, he comforts him in his hour of death. Boromir urged Aragorn to take up his birthright and save his people before he passed. The promise of power, such as that from the ring, ends up being a prison. A prison of the mind as deadly as Angban or Orthan. At this moment, the fellowship might be at its lowest, still pursued by the wraiths, and three companies of orcs and one host of Urukai, though none coordinate and each work towards different, mutually exclusive ends. Grushna. The orc from Mordor who leads the detachment of warriors, under orders from the Dark Lord himself to return the ring to him. The Urukai under Ugluk who is of the Isengard faction, with orders from the White Wizard to bring the ring bearers to Isengard. The third group of orcs in pursuit is acting of their own volition, seeking revenge against the fellowship whose passage through Moria led to the death of this small host's chieftain. The different and incompatible goals among different companies of soldiers on the same side of a conflict are more trouble than it is help. Indeed, it is their infighting that gives Merry and Pippin time to escape while Aomir's riders attack each of the hosts, with casualties from the Rohirrim painful in spite of their victory and absolute destruction and rout of these three militias who were too busy seeking their own purposes. They cannot cooperate or work together for a common purpose, and none who have the will to act can act unless that will is in accord with the Dark Lords. Though it is of note that one of these three groups acted out of loyalty to their fallen chieftain, while the other groups we encounter are acting purely as thralls of greater, more imposing wills than their own. The gift of Isengard is ironic in the end, and this sign of might and fortress for the mighty Saruman of many colours was once an impenetrable fortress. The ring and the moment of Saruman's imprisonment within Orthanc and kept inside the mighty fortress, in the end, mightiest of prisons and potent metaphor which reflects the delusion of permanent strength. What had been the greatest construct of men, built with the unknown craft and law of the men of Numenor, once a gift to Saruman, which was thought of as a great asset, a sign of greatness, sign of strength, such as the trap of the rings when they are worn. The tower was like the rings for the wraiths as in the end the might would become more a prison than a fortress, as those kings of men gave way and faded into the realm of the unseen, literally exhausting their being, drained, drunk like a cup of water and filled with the purpose of another. Sauron is keen to remain behind and let his scheme unfold, as a puppet master and power unseen. His spirit is laid heavy on the page of the history of Middle-earth since the late Second Age, since the downfall of the Golden King, Arpharazon, a Calibre, wherein he sank an island and remade the world and laughed, as he did it not with a knife, but with his silver tongue and those who strive one on one against the will of Sauron are hardly up to the charge. Though Aragorn is able for a moment to still his mind when Sauron sees him holding one of the Palantiri, 
If this had been a long-term challenge, he never would have stood a chance. A weapon of war such as this allows us to address the tactics and personnel Sauron employed. Of them, one is not so well known. Mentioned once in the tale of Beren and Luthien, during Wethin. This could mean the Woman of Shadow, though not a woman as such. It is a shape taken by this fell spirit. This phase disguise is that of a vampire, with great leather wings each adorned at the joint with iron spurs. She was known to be the messenger of Sauron, the listener of whispers who reported back to the Dark Lord. She may have been a Maya, or something more in the line of Ungoliant, but either way, a powerful ally. This also means we should touch upon the child of Ungoliant, the dark spider that lived within Kirithungal, Shelob, a creature as foul as her mother was vile. The children of Ungoliant are children of pain, of darkness, and greed that they feed on the slain. However, Sauron and Shelob were not actually allies. Sauron knew she lived there and did not disturb her as he would know how useful she was at guarding that way. Maybe he held a slight fear over what her mother did to Morgoth, worrying that if he tried to challenge her, some of that power may still live within her. Or perhaps more that it was a mutual understanding. He had his home defended, and she had food, so why disturb that? But either way, Sauron knew how to get a good deal out of this. If this meant a step towards victory, why even think of disturbing it? Now if we step back again for a moment, back to the Battle of the Gwathlo, we had the joint Elven Numenorean force coming from the north and drove before them great slaughter, with Sauron, the foul spirit barely escaping with his life, though he and a personal guard survived what was otherwise, as we said, a field of great slaughter. In the Second Age, the siege of orcs to Eriador comprised armies of hundreds of thousands, though different companies of orcs have different general allegiances. The Second Age is a failure for Sauron when he fled, returning to Mordor like a coward. The Kingdom of Linden was in the afternoon of its might, and the Tree of Nimloth bloomed greatly in the court of Armenelos back on the island. Linden was on the verge of ruin when the relief arrived in the way of Tarministia's fleet. However, the humans are corrupted later when Sauron is brought to the island as a should-be prisoner. His wrath was slow, but absolute. Sauron would have most likely wiped the Elves of Linden from the world, if not for the arrival of the forces of Numenor. Now for the long years, the Numenorians had brought in their ships to the Grey Havens, and there they were welcome. As soon as Gilgalad began to fear that Sauron would come with the open war that he threatened into Eriador, he sent messages to Numenor, and on the shores of Linden, the Numenorians began to build up a force and supplies for war. In 1695, when Sauron invaded Eriador, Gilgalad called on Numenor for aid. Then Tarministia, the king, sent out a great navy, but it was delayed and did not reach the coasts of Middle-earth until the year 1700. By that time, Sauron had mastered all of Eriador, saving only the besieging of Imladris, and he had reached the line of the River Loon. He had summoned more forces which were approaching from the southeast and were indeed in Enedwaith at the crossing of Tharbat, which was only lightly held. Gilgalad and the Numenorians were holding the loon in desperate defense of the Grey Havens, when in the very nick of time the great armament of Tarministia came in, and Sauron's host was heavily defeated and driven back. The Numenorian admiral Kiriata sent part of his ships to make a landing further south as well and Sauron has every disadvantage as a leader of soldiers. As most effective armies are comprised entirely of persons with like minds, each agreed on a purpose and working towards a cause together in ways unfeasible to orcs, and the forces of Sauron always used infantry as the bury with bodies technique, invoking a war attrition and wait until the cost becomes too high to pay. For not one dead orc matters to Sauron, nor 1,000 dead orcs matter, but Gil-galad, he matters to half a million people if not more, and Elendil as well, who was slain by Sauron on the plain of Dagolat. While he uses a mace in the films, the textual evidence we have suggests that his most preferred weapon was in fact his hands. The personal touch and up-close nature of this type of murder are the kind we find 
in serial killers, not in wartime generals who lead troops into battle. There is something personal in this that speaks to a deeper evil in Sauron, one that surpasses that of Morgoth, who, though a sadist, still kept the distance of the hammer between him and his prey. Sauron killed with his hands, and this says a lot. Sauron's actions reflect those of a serial killer, more than a real example of a wartime leader like someone of the likes of Winston Churchill or a Theodore Roosevelt, or for that sake even someone like a Joseph Stalin. We have no reports as yet that Stalin ever used his bare hands, so I kind of hope you get what I mean with that. These character types are narcissists whose primary enjoyment is violence, and the enjoyment for Sauron is the bleak suffering and hopelessness of others, like a parasite that feeds on joy, a ringworm that eats away at every happy memory and humane impulse in you, like those he corrupts. They begin with human hearts, fallible but not by any means evil, and he lays his curse on them as a botfly lays its eggs. The way this happens is how Sauron works. First, the mosquito lays the egg inside a caterpillar by paralysing it and secondly, leaves the larvae inside the paralysed caterpillar to feed until it's able to fly. It eats its way out from the inside and bursts out, metamorphoses into a new being, its life bringing an end to the host. Sauron would do this with his words, which became the botfly buried in us. It eats away at our joys, our loves and memories of fondness, and leaves only resentment spite and bitterness, but it does not kill us when exiting. The corruptive force of Sauron is the botfly that never stops eating, and is only put off by the purest of hearts. It is easy to be a saint in paradise, it is said, but few of us live in a paradise. Sauron is able to see through the Palantir that Denethor is without hope and that the threat of mass killing in itself is enough to cow the good steward. The strategic use of terrorism in concert with mass killings is how Sauron eliminates rivals and recruits allies. Saruman in Rohan targets the men loyal to Theoden and spares the wild men. Those who remain loyal in areas around Minas Tirith are spared too. The mass killings target enemies or sympathisers, which amplifies the usage of violence tenfold when you know what happens when you disobey and when you do what you are told. Sauron is not a cartoonish villain who resorts to mass killing for its own sake. His attacks have clear goals and their means are toward a political end. The War of the Ring breaks out in Rohan because Saruman is able to act at a distance from Sauron, and since he is unable to take the kingdom from the inside through Grima, he resorts to mass killing only when he is unable to conquer the Horse Lord. The final example of Sauron's use of violence and terrorism can be said to be the most vile of all. When the siege of Minas Tirith begins on the dawnless day, his goal is to coerce its soldiers to surrender. The soldiers who remain behind are forced to look on as the city siege is began with the catapulting of decapitated heads of former Gondorian soldiers over the city walls. Just imagine how awful that would be to live through and then have to fight afterwards. Before the terror attacks, an innumerable orc raids were brought to an end in the Third Age. The terrors inflicted by the Dark Lord on the peoples of Aeol and further Rohirrim were great, and the psychological toll exacted on the civilian population part of the audience he is trying to reach by using terrorism as a tactic. Terrorism, as Professor Andrew Wilson of the US Naval War College taught, is played out in five audiences. Sauron is considerate enough to target each audience in ways that are effective and meaningful. The five audiences of terrorism include that of, firstly, the civilian population in ideological opposition to the acting party, secondly, the civilian population with sympathies or outright allegiance to the attacking party, thirdly, the audience of the incumbent governing body which they seek to overthrow, fourthly, the enemy opposition and their own rank and file, and finally, an international audience which acts in a way as to dampen the morale of anyone who supports the fighting. A prominent example of overwhelming might being bested in real life is probably that of the American war against North Vietnam. 
An important alliance in opposition to Sauron was that of Gondor and Rohan. Their people share a common cause and great friendship throughout the Third Age. As Sauron regathered his strength and assessed the strengths of his would-be enemies, the forces of Gondor and Rohan together appeared to be a possible threat. If we look at Sun Tzu again, he said, If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. A clear and accurate picture of the enemy, their combined assets and weaknesses. These are important for a would-be invader to know. To destabilize this friendship, Sauron used coordinated attacks of Dunlending raiding parties, those who were earlier driven out of their homeland Kalinardon by Eol's people, the Eothead. The Dunlendings invaded from the west and took Isengard in 2710 and were perceived as a threat as they had been aided by the Corsairs of Umbar and the Easterlings. During the long winter which began in the November of 2758, the Dunlendings, Corsairs and Haradrim attacked from the north led by Wolf, a man who held the self-proclaimed title of King of Rohan, who was once insulted by the King of Eol's people, Helm Hammerhand by asking for his daughter's hand in marriage. The story goes that an arrogant and powerful man named Freka asked for the king's daughter, who is actually unnamed as a wife for his son, Wolf. He refused, of course, mocking this lowly vassal. This would come to a bad end, as the two would duel to the death. Slain on the battlefield, his family would be named enemies of the king. This forced Wolf, son of Freka, into exile. At some point, Wolf became king of the Dunlendings, how though we are not told, and he would build alliances with the Easterlings and Corsairs of Umbar, so that they could achieve a purpose conceived by Sauron in his estimation of his enemies. The time to divide them came at last during the long winter of 2758. The Corsairs of Umbar and Haradrim attacked Gondor so Wolf could press his attack on King Helm Hammerhand, who was defeated at the Fords of Isen by Wolf and his allies. Survivors fell back to the south, taking shelter in the fortress of Suthberg, later known as Hornburg, in the valley of Helm's Deep. Sun Tzu wrote that no army has ever benefited from a prolonged siege. Sauron, however, was not in the scope of this ancient philosopher, as Sauron greatly benefited from this war. King Helm Hammerhand is said to have fought with valour and courage, but his sheer determination was of no reprieve and he would die during one of his night sorties when he went to terrorise the Dunlendings, filling them with fear that the cold and famine of the long winter had become too much for him and his body was found still standing but frozen in the snow. It is not known how the siege ended, whether the Rohirrim broke the siege or the Dunlendings gave it up, but the king's nephew, Freyalaf struck at Wolf from Dunharrow, where survivors of earlier battles had lived, towards Edoras. The Dunlendings were routed, and Wolf was killed. The forces of Gondor were able to provide relief as Freyalaf reclaimed their capital and pushed the Dunlendings back into the north. Sauron was happy to use the Dunlendings as avatars of warfare, as the Dunlendings were the original. Sauron is as apt to see humans destroy themselves as he is to do it himself though his sadism was great. He had no weapon, no equivalent to the hammer of the underworld wielded by Morgoth being Grond. No, Sauron's weapon of choice was his hands or his tongue. This tells us that he enjoys murder by way of his hands, something which is only seen as a last resort of defence by peace-loving people. Sauron delights much in war, and the psychological warfare of the nonsensical raiding parties too. What this does for Sauron is twofold. When Freylaf was crowned king, Saruman the White was in attendance, and his words dripped with honey. It was then the fortress of Isengard was granted to Saruman, along with its Palantir. The idea was that he would provide a necessary buffer against his enemies to the north, not replace them and replay the whole thing as someone who enjoyed it so much that they wanted to see it again. He was not to know after all. This is chronological snobbery, a word which is often associated with C.S. Lewis, though it originated with Professor Tolkien who coined the phrase by accusing Lewis himself of this crime, 
That is, looking back on the mistakes of earlier generations and thinking ourselves obviously less gullible, less foolish. It is not true, and those involved in their own time have no records, as we do, of how everything would play out in the end. Realistically, Sauron would keep repeating these methods until eventually, surely, in his head, he would come out on top. And so, there we have it, a look at the Dark Lord Sauron and how he makes war. Sauron is far from a simple being, even if some do take him as just pure evil. There was a method to all things he did, the method behind the madness as some may say. He was not afraid of anything if it meant he would come out on top. Did he need to strike fast and sacrifice countless orcs and men to win? Fine. Did he need to play the long game to rebuild? Sure. Did he need to manipulate and deceive good people so that they would end up tearing themselves down from the inside? Absolutely. Nothing was an issue. There is nothing he would consider off the table when it came to war. And that is really what makes Sauron so deadly, so cunning, and really just so evil. So I really do hope this video has helped give you the answer of just how Sauron makes war. With that now though, it is time for my question of the day, which is, do you think Sauron is the evilest character in all of Tolkien's Legendarium? If not, who would come out above him? Morgoth? Or maybe even someone else? Let me know all of your thoughts and opinions on this in the comment section below. And now it's time to shout out our patrons. You guys are amazing in supporting our short film project. We are making great progress with it, and I cannot thank you all enough. We have the Divine Power TMMs of Kevin and Abram, the Fire Demon TMMs of Nasheeth, Denversteel, and Gregory, and the Wizard Staff TMMs of John, Andrew, Jennifer, and Hunter as well. All of you are true legends of the Bro Hero. Finally, if you have managed to reach the very end of this video with me today and you are enjoying what you see, then please hit that subscribe button with the bell icon too for all notifications for future uploads. And so with that, thank you for spending just some of your time with me today. I really do hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next time on The Broken Sword.